Lecture 4. As promised, we are now going to talk about the recovery, the demodulation, the reception of AM. So it's the opposite process to what we looked at on Thursday. We're looking at recovery of AM. So we've looked at amplitude modulation. Today we're going to look at demodulation. So it looks like we spent two weeks looking at one thing, and one week we'll be looking at three things next week, okay? But we'll be looking in less detail, okay? So next week we'll be looking at other types of analog amplitude modulation. So today, AM, which is DSB, LC, remember that? So remember this from last week, we said, the modulation index is the depth of modulation, so it's the maximum am amplitude minus the minimum amplitude divided by the sum of those two. And we said for best modulation, you'd have something as high as possible, as close as possible to one. Anything greater than one is over modulation, and that's no good. We spent some time looking about at the spectrum of an AM signal, and we described how the spectrum of an AM signal will be different if you had a single tone or if you had a continuous spectrum. We spoke about the baseband bandwidth and the band pass bandwidth. And we said that the band pass bandwidth is twice the baseband bandwidth. That's a really important um, fact and we'll be looking at that continuously over the next four weeks. We'll be looking at the relationship between baseband bandwidth and band pass bandwidth. Is it one to one, one to two, or one to something greater than two. So in this case, it's one to two. So today we'll look at demodulation. And we'll look at a particular type of demodulator called an envelope detector. It's a really simple kind of uh, detector. Sometimes it's called a diode detector. And we'll spend some time talking about power considerations. On Thursday, there'll be a problem class. That'll be our second problem class. And next week, we'll start talking about DSB. So, again, this is a reminder from last week. We have three scenarios. When you modulate, you either undermodulate, perfectly or critically modulate, or overmodulate. Okay? Generally, we undermodulate, but we want our modulation to be as close as possible to this, as close as possible to perfect modulation. We try to avoid perfect modulation because you have zeros, but perfect modulation is fine. So we want a modulation index up to 100%. So M up to 1. We don't want M to be 0, and we don't want M to be too, too low, and we certainly don't want M to be greater than 1. If M is greater than 1 or greater than 100%, we've overmodulated, and it's not possible to recover the envelope without a phase inversion. Or at least it's not possible using envelope detector. So using today's technique, we have to modulate at M less than 100%. If we were to use another technique, maybe that isn't necessary. So today, for AM detectors, using envelope detector, modulation index must be less than 1. There's a typo there. I'll fix that in a second. Okay, so M greater than 1 is overmodulation. So remember, we spoke about the modulator. We said, what do you think goes on in the modulator? And the answer was we have a DC shift clamping, then we have a multiplication by a high frequency carrier. And that gives us our band pass signal. Now, now, once we have our band pass signal, what do we want to do? We want to recover the original message from the signal. We're trying to recover the original message that's encoded into the envelope there from the original signal. That's the task of demodulation. That's what we're talking about today. How do we recover? Not how do we modulate, not how do we impress and encode, it's how do we decode. How can we trace that yellow envelope? How can we do that at the receiver? 
There's more than one way. We're going to look at the simplest way. The simplest way in terms of electronics, the simplest in terms of power requirements. Okay? And there's a reason for that. Let me give you a little bit of background. Quick video. These are all simple components that would be available in the field. So in, in, in a war zone, you can put these components together yourself. It's the simplest circuit in the world. Notice there's no power supply. There's no battery. See that? Radio without a battery. Radio with no electronics. This is a great project for you to get started in radio. This is the same radio that GIs used as they were in foxholes in Europe. And it's really simple and really fun. It doesn't use any batteries. All the power comes straight out of the air, the radio waves. The power comes straight out of the air. And that's the important part. The power is contained in the carrier. That's why it's called DSB-LC. There's a large carrier that contains enough power for you to be able to operate your homemade radio without any power supply. Okay, so what was going on in that circuit? Two things. One was Rectification, well, two, three things. W one of them is not m included here, which is the tuner. So that coil, that was your tuner. That was to choose the frequency. But this diode is a rectifier. So that takes your AC signal and changes it into a positive AC signal. 
So it clips the negative half cycle. Now, the important bit is the capacitor. The capacitor is the bit that's going to try and recover it's going to try and recover this envelope. How does it do that? Well, imagine you have a capacitor that's charging and then discharging, charging, then discharging, charging, discharging. And it's doing that with every cycle. So the capacitor charges, then discharges, charges, then discharges. If you choose the time constant RC carefully, you're able to help that or to allow that capacitor to trace the envelope. It's not perfect, but it's good enough to be able to hear the radio. Now, you can't have the time constant too big, and you can't have the time constant too small. So it needs to be contained between your carrier frequency and your modulating frequency. That is your message frequency. So if the time constant is too big, then the capacitor, as it discharges, it'll miss parts of the signal. And if it's too high, well, you have high frequency distortion in your signal. But between those, you're able to trace the envelope of your signal. So that's an envelope detector. Here is a little uh, demonstration. There are many others online. Let me see if this is going to work. So it's a little applet where you can change the time constant. Okay, it's not working in this browser. Let you can change the carrier frequency, and that will show you the frequency of the green wave <coughs> changing. You can change the modulating frequency, and that will change the shape of the envelope. And then you can change your time constant here, Tor 1, and that will change how fast the capacitor discharges. And then you can see how best you can trace the envelope. Okay, so see if you can get that up and running on your own computer. There are, other, there are other apps you can find as well, but this is one that I found particularly useful. Sorry I couldn't get it working on this computer today. Second half of today's lecture, we want to talk about power considerations. So you've already seen in that video how it's important in some scenarios for the receiver to be able to receive the signal with simple, low-cost electronics without a power supply. That's not always the case, but sometimes you have a lot of power at the transmitter. You don't have that luxury at the receiver. So in cases like this, AM is suitable. In almost all other cases, AM isn't suitable. So AM has that advantage. So let's try to put some numbers to that. So the total power in this signal, obviously this is exaggerated because there's a big gap here, but the total power in that signal is the sum of the power in the carrier and the power in the sidebands. Where do you think there is more power? In the carrier or in the sidebands? It looks like it's in the sidebands, but it's actually in the carrier. The carrier contains more power than the sidebands. Okay? And we'll see why. So, think back to signals and systems. What's the power of a sine wave? It's just the amplitude squared over 2. We're going to use that. So, quick question for you. What's the power of a sine wave of amplitude 10? Is it working? So, it's 10 squared divided by 2. 100 divided by 2, 50, that was easy. Now, moving on, remember what happens in that modulator box? We said we take our message, which is cosine omega mt. 
or a m cosine omega m t, we multiply it by k, and we say k times a m is this modulation index m. So let's just call it m cosine omega m t. That's my message. Plus 1 multiplied by the carrier in red. If you do the maths, you have a product of two cosines. You have a cosine of the sum, cosine of the difference. We have two components. That's where the two side bands came from. So we have an upper side band, omega c plus omega m, a lower side band, omega c minus omega m. So the total power is the power in the carrier plus the power in the side bands. Upper side band, lower <coughs> side band. So in our actual message, in our sorry, actual AM signal, this doesn't exist. So these don't all exist at the same time. So this is in one plot and this is in another. Quick question. In that signal where the carrier happened to be AC, AC volts, so we have AC cosine omega CT, what's the carrier power? Okay, so it's the amplitude squared over 2. Easy enough. Now we're going to look at each of the sidebands. We're going to look at each of the sidebands, and we're going to ask the same question. What's the power of the sideband? So look at the sideband. Look, look at the upper sideband. Side How much power do you think there is in that? That's the next question. How much power is there in the upper sideband? So you take that amplitude, which is half AC times M, you square it, and then divide by 2. So if you square the half, you get a quarter. You half that, you get 1 over 8. So it's 1 over 8 M squared AC squared. OK, so it's option C there. So it's all that squared divided by 2. Now, that's the power in the lower upper side band. The power in the lower side band is exactly the same. So together, we have 1 quarter AC squared. So now we want to find the ratio of the side band power to the total power. So the ratio of useful power to non-useful power is something we call efficiency, or power efficiency. So power efficiency is the ratio of the useful power, which is the power in both sidebands, <coughs> divided by the total power, which is the power of the carrier plus the power of the sidebands. If we do that, just a little bit of manipulation, cancel all the ACs, add the fractions, multiply throughout, we end up with this expression, m squared over 2 plus m squared. That tells me the efficiency as a function of the modulation index. So if you, you know the depth of modulation, you can find the efficiency. This is a really important relationship. It's almost the only relationship we need for lecture four. So the two things you need to know for lecture four, or the two mathematical relationships, are that the time constant, RC, is somewhere between 1 over FC and 1 over FM. The second thing you need to know is that the power efficiency is m squared over 2 plus m squared. Now, ask yourselves, how high can that power efficiency be? What's the maximum power efficiency? For AM, can we achieve 100% power efficiency? How close to 100% can we get? So look at that formula and ask yourself, what's the most efficient? So the most, the best modulation is when m is 100%. So m is 1. So you'll have 1 squared over 2 plus 1 squared. So that's 1 third, or 33.3%. 
So the best efficiency we can achieve is 33.3%. That means 67% of the power is wasted. Is it really wasted? Yeah. No. 67% of the power contains no information. That's true. But it's not wasted. It was used to power the radio. So that 67%... That's the carrier term. That's what made it possible to use an envelope detector. So that's a cost for the transmitter. It's a benefit for the receiver. Okay? So the 67%, you can call it wasted power. It's wasted in terms of information, but it's not wasted in terms of the reason why we're using AM. We're using it so that the receiver can be very simple and it can recover from the envelope. But in terms of power, yes, it's, it's wasted power in terms of information. So the maximum power efficiency is 33%. Okay. Summary of what we spoke about today. In AM, we have two sidebands, an upper sideband and a lower sideband. We have three cases. Overmodulation, undermodulation, and perfect modulation or critical modulation. We tend to undermodulate as close as possible to critical modulation or to perfect modulation. The bandwidth of an AM signal is twice the baseband bandwidth. So if you have a 10 kilohertz signal, you need 20 kilohertz of bandwidth. Most of the power is in the carrier. 67 or more than 67 percent of the power is in the carrier. That means the highest efficiency we can achieve is 33 percent. We use AM in commercial AM broadcasting where we have one transmitter with lots of power and many receivers. The frequency range of AM is in the upper kilohertz. So we're talking about 500 kilohertz all the way to very low megahertz. Okay, after, then, after that, it becomes FM. Okay, so AM, you have low frequencies, high kilohertz, long wavelengths. FM, that's what we're going to talk about in three weeks' time. That's where we have higher frequencies. So that's a summary of today's class. Thursday, there'll be a problem class. It'll be a Cahoots class with a problem sheet that I'll give you and there will be online solutions to those problems. We'll talk about other types of analog modulation on, th on Monday. Next Monday, we'll talk about DSB, SSB, VSB. We'll talk about modulation, demodulation. That, that, that'll take two weeks. And then there'll be a problem class after that. So, short lecture today. I hope you found that useful. I'll see you all on Thursday. Take a second, please, to let me know how today's lecture went. <laughs>